Chapter 3. Rum, Botany and the Lash The females of most countries that he has visited have undergone every critical inspection by him. The Town and Country magazine on Joseph Banks, 1773. The Captain and that Plant Guy Australians know all about Captain James Cook. As schoolchildren, they dutifully traced his voyage from Plymouth to Australia in hand-me-down textbooks, made egg carton and paddle pop stick models of the endeavour, and were dragged out in the rain to visit the uninspiring Captain Cook monument at Botany Bay. The monument honours Cook for first setting foot on Australian soil on 28 April 1770, although he didn't arrive until the following afternoon. There can be no finer tribute to Australia's Shilby Wright attitude than this error having remained uncorrected for over 140 years. Cook stares out at us from portraits, stamps and commemorative coins. The great captain stands tall and proud, one hand resting on Ray's knee while the other proprietarily fondles a sextant. He gazes into the middle distance, his dour countenance that of a man confronted by the stench of the 90 closely confined sailors whom he has recently force-fed pickled cabbage in an attempt to warn off scurvy. <laughs> Cook's men should have been grateful that they didn't sail under Vitus Bering or Vasco da Gama. Vitus believed that scurvy could be cured by touching soil and perished from the disease and or hypothermia shortly after being half buried in the midwinter tundra of the island that now bears his name. Vasco insisted that his crew combat scurvy by gargling their own urine. Almost 70% of his men died, leaving the survivors with a nasty taste in their mouths. Tourists can visit Cooktown in Queensland, board a replica of Cook ships in Sydney, or wonder why the hell a 1755 stone cottage owned by Cook's parents was transported from Yorkshire to Melbourne's Fitzroy Gardens. Before leaving for home, they can purchase a Captain Cook souvenir tea towel, a Captain Cook snow dome, or a Captain Cook novelty apron with fake Captain Cook breasts. We know they are fake because Captain Cook's real breasts were barbecued by Hawaiians in 1779. Cook is now considered the greatest navigator of his era, the equal of Ferdinand Magellan, Vasco da Gama and James Tiberius Kirk. Captain James Kirk was named after Captain James Cook, and the USS Enterprise was named after the HMS Endeavour. Star Trek's catchphrase, to boldly go where no man has gone before, was inspired by Cook's journal entry, Ambition leads me farther than any other man has been before me. Enterprise and Endeavour, the first and last space shuttles, were named after the ships of Kirk and Cook. There are bound to be other links between Captain Cook, Star Trek and the US space program, and some Australian university will no doubt award a grant to explore this issue of undisputed national significance. Cook's great fame would have surprised his peers, as Cook only really captured the public imagination when he became the meat between the bread in the Sandwich Islands, Hawaii. Before Cook was cooked, his greatest claim to fame was being the guy who steered the boat for the dashing Joseph Banks. Most Australians vaguely remember Sir Joseph Banks as that plant guy. Tourists intrigued by the great botanist must make do with visiting the Canberra suburbs of Banks or Sydney's Bankstown. They are sadly unable to see Banks' reconstructed family home or buy Banks-themed kitsch. This is terribly unfair because Banks was once known as the father of Australia. It was Banks who first recommended that the British establish a penal colony at Botany Bay. It was Banks who influenced early British thinking on relations with the Aboriginal people and advised the Crown on all matters New South Welsh during the first decades of settlement. It was Banks who instructed Matthew Flinders to circumnavigate Australia in order to put beyond doubt that it was a single continent. It was Banks who stole merinos from the Spanish, allowing generations of Australians to ride on the sheep's back. And it was Banks who got the mutiny-prone William Bly into both breadfruit and governorship, indirectly contributing to the only military coup in Australian history. A normal man would have been exhausted by these great deeds, but Banks still had time to oversee British science for 41 years, develop the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew, organise voyages of exploration to Africa and Brazil, and engage in vigorous group sex. 
Banks' role in shaping Australia was so neglected over the years that he wasn't recognised on an Australian stamp until 1970, and then he was only a background figure. Banks wasn't even the first botanist to be licked and stuffed into an Australian post box, this honour falling to Sir Ferdinand Jacob Heinrich von Mueller in 1948 for his services to the macadamia nut. So, just who was Joseph Banks? Young Master Banks. Joseph Banks came from a family of self-made lawyers and politicians whose vast piles of cash made the inbred aristocracy turn a blind eye to their vulgar origins. At nine, Joseph was sent to Harrow Public School to learn Greek, Latin and archery, a compulsory subject until 1771. He was good at organised games, but academically hopeless, so his father moved him to Eton at the age of 13. The English call their elite private schools public schools on the grounds that members of the public are allowed to attend in their capacity as butlers, porters, char ladies, and jolly red-faced cooks with tuck shop lady arms. Eton provided the finest education that money and selective breeding could buy. Its boys smoked pipes to improve their health and engaged in the quaint annual tradition of chasing a hamstrung ram before bludgeoning it to death with purpose-made ram bludgeoning clubs. More faint-hearted students could engage in school-sponsored badger, bull or bear baiting. With its rich assortment of terrified animals, Eton provided the perfect atmosphere in which Joseph's interest in natural history could flourish. Banks moved on to Oxford despite his poor academic record and, like many young gentlemen of means, did not have to do anything so common as obtain a degree. University was a place for young men of breeding to mark time until they received their inheritances. Banks' father, assisted by dying in 1761, leaving him estates yielding £6,000 a year. Cook, in contrast, received £120 a year for commanding the endeavour. Banks spent his uni days studying plants and young women, with the Town and Country magazine, a scandal sheet of unparalleled bitchiness, reporting... Oxford echoed with his amours, and the bedmakers of his college have given the world some testimonials of his vigour. Banks left Oxford in 1764 as a tall, unusually handsome and physically fit young man. He made friends easily, was successful with the ladies, and was richer than God. He was the type of man historians, who typically enjoy none of these characteristics, refer to as a lucky bastard. The Enlightened Banks. Banks was a devoted son of the Enlightenment, that era in European and American history when reason replaced blind faith, science replaced alchemy, and Sir Christopher Wren replaced Sir Isaac Newton's toilet roll every Tuesday afternoon because Sir Isaac was too busy inventing gravity. The English Enlightenment began in 1687 with the release of Newton's Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, The Australian Enlightenment began in 1988 with the release of John Farnham's Age of Reason. Newton and the other new scientists were devoted to personal observation, and this inevitably led to self-experimentation. Newton once inserted a large needle into his eye socket and rubbed it around, "'Betwixt my eye and the bone as near to the backside of my eye as I could,' because he was interested in the effect that this would have on his vision. Not good." Henry Cavendish, the most brilliant physicist and chemist of the 18th century, sought to understand electricity by repeatedly exposing himself to increasingly powerful shocks, diligently describing the effects on his body until he lapsed into unconsciousness. Cavendish, now thought to have been an autistic savant, had only two interests, science and collecting period furniture. He was pathologically shy and would only communicate with his female servants by note. He added a staircase to the back of his mansion so he could run away whenever he heard his housekeeper approaching. William Stark, determined to unlock the secrets of scurvy, placed himself on a diet of bread and water until he contracted the disease. He then substituted the bread for one or two foods at a time in the hope he would find a dish that would perk him up a bit. Stark kept a diary of how sick he felt and died eight months into the experiment, while subsisting entirely on honey pudding and Cheshire cheese. Banks shared the commitment of these great but incredibly stupid men to understanding the world through direct observation. 
As a teenager, he rubbed his face with toads to disprove the superstition that they caused warts. Banks applied this experimental spirit to natural history. He would not stay at home waiting for the next shipment of exotic flora. He would bloody well go into the world and pick some flowers. Banks abroad. Young Englishmen of a certain class made the transition to manhood through a grand tour of southern Europe, visiting the art galleries and city bars of Paris and the grand cathedrals and bordellos of Rome. Grand tourists were expected to collect things. Many collected ancient coins, Renaissance paintings or marble statues of ladies with wardrobe malfunctions. Nearly all collected interesting rashes. Upon their return, they would display their collections, except for the rashes, in glass cases or tasteful salons for their chinless friends to bray at. Men of science were also collectors, but would study, sort and classify their acquisitions. Bank fell into this camp and, as others had already classified the plants of southern Europe, he determined to take his grand tour in Canada. The only way to get safely to Canada, recently surrendered by the French, was to hitch a ride with the Royal Navy. Banks had the connections to make this happen. Banks had befriended his neighbour, John Montague, the fourth Earl of Sandwich. Sandwich was a senior member of the Crown and had recently been First Lord of the Admiralty, which meant he could get people on boats. Like Banks, he was interested in botany, fishing, drinking and prostitutes. Banks and Sandwich's fishing trips were legendary, with the philosopher David Hume reporting that they would pack two or three ladies of pleasure to look after their rods and tackle. Sandwich was a notorious libertine and founding member of the Hellfire Club, which operated out of a converted abbey decorated with tasteful French pornography. Club members would attend dressed as monks or biblical characters, get drunk and frolic with women dressed as nuns in luxuriously furnished caves under the abbey. Members liked to play pranks on each other. John Wilkes, the radical parliamentary reformer, once bought a baboon dressed in a cape and horns to a club function and convinced the inebriated Sandwich that it was the devil. Sandwich, who never forgave Wilkes, later said to him, Sir, I do not know whether you will die on the gallows or of the pox. Wilkes, one of the great wits of his age, immediately replied, That depends, my lord, on whether I embrace your lordship's principles or your mistress. Sandwich arranged for Banks to travel to Canada aboard the HMS Niger. Banks was in heaven. He studied jellyfish, killed a new kind of mouse, caught a 6 foot 11 inch halibut and collected numerous plants, animals and the scalp of Sam Fry, a fisherman who had been killed by Indians a year earlier, starting his lifelong fascination with collecting human heads. The return trip also led to Banks developing a lifelong prejudice against the Portuguese, on the unusual grounds that their taste in gardening is more trifling than can be conceived. But Banks's greatest success occurred in his absence. While he was murdering mice in Newfoundland, Sandwich had arranged for him to be elected a Fellow of the Royal Society. Banks in Society The Royal Society was the premier British club for eggheads, carrying the very enlightenment motto, nullius in verba, take nobody's word for it. It included brilliant scientists, their wealthy patrons, and eccentric like the Reverend William Borlase, who tabled regular papers on how much it was or wasn't raining in Cornwall. <laughs> Borlase's Royal Society paper, an account of the late mild weather in Cornwall, of the quantity of rain fallen there in the year 1762, was only exceeded in boringness by William Arderon's An Account of Rain Fallen in a Foot Square at Norwich. Other Royal Society papers of the era included An Account of the Degree of Cold Observed in Bedfordshire, Some Observations on Swarms of Gnats, particularly one seen at Oxford, August 20, 1766, Experiments and Observations upon a Blue Substance Found in a Peat Moss in Scotland, and the gripping Remarks on the Very Different Accounts that Have Been Given of the Fecundity of Fishes with fresh observations on that subject. The Royal Society was also a participant in the world's first international scientific venture, calculating the distance between the Earth and Sun by measuring the transit of Venus across the Sun's face from various parts of the globe. 
Pairs of transits occurred eight years apart every 243 years, and observations of the 1761 transit had been thwarted by war, bad weather and incompetence. The Royal Society decided it would send observers to Canada, South Africa and Tahiti for the 1769 transit. Its choice to lead the Tahitian expedition was a middle-aged Royal Navy warrant officer who had just submitted a paper to the Society titled An Observation of an Eclipse of the Sun at the Island of Newfoundland, August 5, 1766, by Mr James Cook, with the longitude of the place of observation deduced from it. Cook was the son of a farm labourer and a one-time grocer's apprentice who had started his sailing career hauling coal on the Freelove, one of Britain's more bohemian merchant vessels. He had killed some Frenchmen and drawn some nice maps of the Canadian coast during the Seven Years' War and was a keen astronomer to boot. Cook was promoted to the rank of lieutenant and told to pack his bags for Tahiti. He was also told to pack Joseph Banks. Banks was not easy to pack. While the three Royal Society expeditions cost a combined £4,000, Bank insisted on carrying £10,000 worth of equipment. There was his natural history library, botanical trays and boxes, paints and fine paper, numerous nets for snaring unsuspecting fish, jars and alcohol for pickling insects, a sturdy boat and umbrellas for all weather conditions, ranging from fine silk to heavy oilskin. Banks also took his botanical buddy, Daniel Solander, a pudgy and humorless Swede, Herman Sporing Jr., a Finnish scientific dog's body, the Scottish artists Sidney Parkinson and Alexander Buchan, four servants and two greyhounds. Space on board the Endeavour was at a premium, and the story cook ended up sharing the captain's cabin with Banks, Solander and an ever-increasing number of plants and pickled animals. Banks farewelled Harriet Blossett, his 17-year-old fiancée, the night before he set sail. Banks, whose feelings towards Harriet ranged between tepid and ambivalent, did what any man would do when confronted with an emotionally tricky situation. He got totally, utterly and paralytically pissed. Banks in transit. Banks spent his first days aboard the Endeavour emptying his guts into the English Channel. His killer hangover would not have seemed unusual to Cook's crew, who lived on a steady diet of rum with occasional servings of sodomy and the lash. The Endeavour had set sail with 604 gallons of rum and four tonnes of beer. Alcohol was the first item on the shopping list every time she pulled into port, with 3,032 gallons of wine picked up at her first stop at Madeira. Each sailor was given a pint of 94% proof rum a day, except for the ship's boys, who had to make do with a half pint. The Endeavour's sailors were constantly tripping over each other, bumping into masts that shouldn't be there, and pissing in Banks's seed trays. Robert Anderson, the ship's quartermaster, was flogged for extreme drunkenness when the Endeavour moored in Rio de Janeiro. John Redding, who was responsible for administering the flogging, was too sozzled to pick up the whip and was himself lashed. Redding later died of alcohol poisoning after drinking a pint and a half of rum in a single session, as did Robert Molyneux, the ship's master. Dick Orton, Cook's clerk, got so spanned one night that a sailor was able to cut off his clothes and carve chunks from both his ears without waking him. Life on board was hard. The Endeavour, which was only 32 metres long and 9 metres wide, had to accommodate dogs, cats, pigs, chickens and the ship's goat, along with 94 men and two fictional children. <laughs> Cook fraudulently registered his five- and six-year-old sons as crew to speed their eligibility to sit the Royal Navy Lieutenant Examination, which required previous service at sea. The sailors aboard the Endeavour lived in hammocks strung 14 inches apart and were forced to wash their clothes in their own urine whenever fresh water ran low. Food was also an issue. Cook had encountered problems getting decent kitchen help for the expedition. He rejected the first chef assigned to him for being too frail and was then given John Thompson, who had lost one of his arms below the elbow. Banks described the gastronomic delights served by the ship's shorthand cook. Our bread, indeed, is but indifferent, occasioned by the quantity of vermin that are in it. I have seen hundreds, nay thousands, shaken out of a single biscuit. 
We in the cabin have, however, an easy remedy for this by baking it in an oven, not too hot, which makes them all walk off. But this cannot be allowed to the private people who must find the taste of these animals very disagreeable. But Cook ran a better ship than most. The lash was used sparingly, principally on sailors who refused to eat their pickled cabbage. He demanded regular fumigation of the sleeping quarters and was so concerned about the hygiene risks posed by the defecating monkeys his sailors kept as pets that he had them all thrown shrieking into the Pacific Ocean. The monkeys, not the sailors. Banks enjoyed life at sea. He got to sleep in a comfy cabin and had packed lots of expensive wine and tasty treats for himself. But his greatest pleasure was sitting on deck and blasting passing seabirds out of the sky. His record was 69 in a day. The Endeavour's stopover at Madeira gave Banks an opportunity to renew his prejudice against the Portuguese. He didn't like their people. Exceedingly idle, exceedingly conservative. Or their wine. Ill-made, ill-cultivated and carried on men's head in goatskins. And amused himself by electrocuting Madeira's scientifically curious governor, giving him as many shocks as he cared for, perhaps more. The Endeavour crossed the equator on 25 October 1769, the first time Cook had ventured into the Southern Hemisphere. Cook was not a well-travelled seaman. Even the ship's goat was more experienced, having circumnavigated the globe the previous year. Sailors, upon crossing the equator, would get absolutely plastered and dress up as the god of the sea. Those who were crossing the line for the first time were dunked three times from the yardarm. Sailors found this an unpleasant experience, as the vast majority couldn't swim. Still, drowning was more pleasant than the 18th century method of resuscitation. A drowning victim would awaken on deck to rudely discover his pants around his ankles, a tube inserted into his rear end, and some toothless deckhand vigorously blowing tobacco smoke up his kazi. The warmth of the smoke was believed to encourage respiration, but suspicion about the efficacy of tobacco enemas led to their disappearance by 1810 and the introduction of the popular expression, you're blowing smoke up my ass." The ship's crew and passengers could avoid a dunking if they paid a fine in rum. Banks and Cook paid up. The endeavour stopped at Rio de Janeiro, where the Viceroy, another despicable Portuguese, confined Cook and Banks to ship as spies because he could not believe that anyone would be stupid enough to sail around the world just to look at Venus or collect flowers. Banks risked his life by lowering himself out of his porthole in the middle of the night so that he could engage in a few hours nocturnal botanising. Banks first encountered the banana, which he loathed in Rio. Banks and Dampier were generals on opposing sides of the Banana Wars, a fruity conflict largely ignored by historians. Banks was finally able to venture ashore in daylight once the endeavour had rounded Tierra del Fuego, where the Fuegian Indians received him with many uncouth signs of friendship. Even the broad-minded Banks was taken aback by the Fuegian custom of welcoming guests with a display of vigorous masturbation. Fuegian translated... We come in peace. Banks in paradise. In Tahiti, Cook observed the transit of Venus, his men observed the topless Polynesian women in their grass skirts, and Banks observed the grass skirts, which were woven from a fascinating new subspecies of pili grass. Admittedly, he found it easier to study the skirts after gently prizing the topless Polynesian women out of them. Banks' account of his three months in Tahiti reads like a cross between Gardening Monthly and Lady Chatterley's lover. In the island of Otahiti, where love is the chief occupation, the favourite, nay, almost the sole luxury of the inhabitants, both the bodies and souls of the women are moulded into the utmost perfection for that soft science. He continues breathlessly. The foremost of the women quickly unveiling all her charms, gave me a most convenient opportunity of admiring them by turning herself gradually round. She then once more displayed her naked beauties and immediately marched up to me. I took her by the hand and led her to the tents, accompanied by another woman, her friend. To both of them I made presents, but could not prevail upon them to stay more than an hour. But Banks was not solely interested in sex and botany. 
He learned the Tahitian language, was intrigued by the Tahitians' tattoos, Banks introduced the word tattoo into the English language, wanted to take up surfing after seeing the locals ride the waves, and participated in a religious ceremony wearing only a loincloth and body paint. Cook's time in paradise was less pleasant. Repairs to the endeavour were seriously threatened when the crew stole 120 pounds of nails, which were the Tahitian currency for negotiable affection. Cook's relation with the locals grew increasingly strained as a result of their tendency to make off with anything that wasn't nailed down, which was quite a lot following the disappearance of the nails. The instrument necessary to measure the transit disappeared within 24 hours of being brought ashore, and although the athletic banks recovered it after chasing the thief for seven miles, Cook, the drunken astronomer Green, and Salander all recorded different times for the transit. The mission was an astronomical failure. By the time the endeavour set sail, Banks had convinced two locals, Tupia and Tiata, to return to England with him. He wrote of Tupia, I do not know why I may not keep him as a curiosity, as well as some of my neighbours do lions and tigers, at a larger expense than he will probably ever put me to. Banks, down under. Although Cook had secret orders to sail south from Tahiti to find Terra Australis, he considered the search for an imaginary continent to be a complete waste of time. After discovering lots of empty ocean, he sailed to New Zealand, which Banks, despite all evidence to the contrary, insisted must be the mythical Great Southern Land. While the Maori spoke Polynesian, they were nothing like the Tahitians, being more interested in eating Cook's crew than giving them a full-body breadfruit massage. Cook believed he could cultivate a friendship with the natives by kidnapping them and then being kind to them. He found it hard to get to the being kind part, however, as the Maori showed their displeasure at being kidnapped by fighting to the death. After four Maori were killed by Cook's kindness, Banks recorded, Thus ended the most disagreeable day my life has yet seen, that such may never return to embitter my reflections. However, he perked up a few days later when one of the local cannibals gave him a human head for his collection. After charting New Zealand, Cook decided to head home via the east coast of New Holland and, on 19 April 1770, sighted Australia. Banks was unimpressed. He wrote that the land reminded him of the back of a lean cow and was, in every respect, the most barren country I have seen. But he was happier than Larry when the endeavour moored at Stingray Harbour. Cook was so struck by the image of the insanely grinning banks emerging from the undergrowth with novel plant life strapped to every square inch of his body that he renamed the harbour Botany Bay. The Guagal of Botany Bay initially ignored the endeavour and its crew of white ghosts, but when Cook made for shore, two warriors pelted the landing party with stones and spears. Cook responded with gunfire, wounding one and forcing both to flee. All attempts at further contact were rebuffed, with Cook wistfully reporting that, All they seemed to want was for us to be gone. The endeavour sailed up the coast, occasionally setting Banks ashore to pick flowers and terrorise the local wildlife. Banks named the kangaroo and quoll, adopting the local Aboriginal names, and described the dingo, a species of possum, and the flying fox, which one superstitious sailor believed to be the devil. From this one might infer that Satan is small, furry, and hangs upside down in trees eating fruit. But sailors' descriptions of wildlife are not to be trusted. Sailors also mistook the dugong, which is the world's ugliest animal, for a gorgeous bare-breasted lady with the tail of a fish, giving rise to the legend of the mermaid. Cook, belying his subsequent reputation as a master mariner, then ran the endeavour straight up the guts of the Great Barrier Reef, a structure that can be seen from outer space, but apparently not from 100 yards. Cook camped on the Queensland coast for seven weeks while the ship was being repaired. The local Aborigines were reserved, but displayed some signs of friendliness when they were not trying to burn Cook's camp to the ground. Fire stick farming is not just useful for clearing the land of undergrowth. It's also great for clearing the land of uninvited white people. Aboriginal warriors frequently used fire as a weapon in their conflicts with the British invaders. 
the Aboriginal tendency to torch anything vaguely flammable led Cook to describe Australia as... This continent of smoke. Banks spent his time happily botanising during this enforced sojourn. He also had an opportunity to test his theory that the natives were just Polynesians in need of a good bath by rubbing an Aborigine's skin with spit. Banks only conceded that the Aborigines were a distinct people when this attempt to relieve the unfortunate native of his exceeding blackness failed. The endeavour finally limped away from the Queensland coast and reached Possession Island in the Torres Strait on 22 August 1770, where Cook claimed Eastern Australia for Great Britain. His orders from the Admiralty concerning Terra Australis instructed, You are also, with the consent of the natives, to take possession of convenient situations in the country in the name of the King of Great Britain. Cook's views on the niceties of this dispossession would have been influenced by Banks, who was scathing in his assessment of the locals. He labelled them rank cowards and the most uncivilised savages perhaps in the world because of their habit of running away from men who wanted to shoot them or rub them with spit. They were ignorant of the arts of cultivation and wandered like the Arabs from place to place. And, he concluded from their indifference to the beads and other old tat generally proffered by Cook, had no interest in property. Banks believed that the Aborigines thinly populated the coast and having apparently dozed off during logic classes at Oxford, he posited, Aborigines only eat seafood, there is no seafood in land, therefore there are no Aborigines in land. Banks' view that the vast interior of New Holland was empty and its coast sparsely populated by a handful of homeless savages who wouldn't even ask King George for his beads was hugely influential on later British policy. Banks takes to bed. After casually pocketing half a continent, Cook sailed with all haste to Batavia, the nearest European-controlled port. Batavia was built by the Dutch, who love canals, and the city's marble-lined waterways eased their homesickness. But those same waterways trickled liquid death, because the only things in all God's creation that love canals more than the Dutch are mosquitoes. Batavia was a malarial mecca, and its bloodthirsty pilgrims launched an airborne jihad against the endeavour. Cook's entire company, with the exception of John Ravenhill, sunk into fevered delirium. Ravenhill, the endeavour's oldest sailor at almost 80, was noted for being generally more or less drunk every day. The crew concluded that hard liquor was the secret to his health and exacerbated the crisis by drinking vast quantities of rum. They would have been right had they drunk vast quantities of gin and tonic, as the quinine in tonic water was the world's first effective anti-malarial. But unfortunately, the gin and tonic was not invented until 1825. William Monkhouse, the ship's doctor, was the first to die. Six others followed, including Tupia and Tiata, depriving banks of the opportunity to display them as curiosities at London dinner parties. Banks determined that if he was to ascend the final trellis to the great arboreum in the sky, then he would do so in comfort. He set himself up in a luxurious villa where his convalescence was aided by eight slaves and two obliging Malay women. Recovered, he rejoined the endeavour as it crawled out of Batavia. Forty of the crew were still incapable of leaving their hammocks and fever and dysentery stalked the ship all the way to Cape Town. 34 men were lost by the time she made port, including Parkinson, Sporing and the astronomer Green, who died from hanging his legs out of a porthole in a suspected rum fueled frenzy. This is one of history's more confusing causes of death. It is not clear whether Green's drunken legs caught a chill, were crushed between the ship's hull and an iceberg, or were ripped off by a passing shark. Following Green's mysterious demise, and to the surprise of everyone, John Ravenhill's lifeless body was found one morning, embalmed in enough rum to open a small bar. Drinking levels suddenly dropped. Banks now turned his eyes towards home. He could not have imagined even his most fevered malarial dreams, the reception he would receive upon his return. The immortal Banks. Joseph Banks was a publicity slut. As soon as he stepped off the boat, he let the world know that he had single-handedly discovered around 1,400 plants and over 1,000 animals. 
He took to the podium at Oxford and Cambridge, where staid men of science screamed hysterically and hurled their long johns at him. Carl Linnaeus, the father of modern botany and taxonomy, dubbed him the Immortal Banks and lobbied for New South Wales to be renamed Banksia. The reptiles of Fleet Street crawled out from under their paving stones to bask in the sunlight that beamed from Banks's backside, scribbling, grovelling homages while reminding their readers that Cook was a mere lieutenant. Banks was a must-have guest at all the right parties and became a confidant and frequent companion of King George III. It is not surprising that Mad King George formed an attachment to the dashing young botanist, given his later penchant for talking to trees. Nor were women immune to Banks' charms. Having quietly paid Miss Blossett £5,000 to go away, Banks became the patron of a young lady who had been left penniless when her father died under the weight of his gambling debts. He provided her with a comfortable house and an illegitimate daughter, the only child he would ever have. Banks also entered into a relationship with his housekeeper, who became his well-known but socially invisible in polite company mistress. The town and country magazine salaciously reported these extra botanical activities. The other great celebrity to emerge from the voyage was the Endeavour's goat, which was awarded a silver collar engraved with a poem penned by Dr Samuel Johnson of dictionary fame. In fame scarce second to the nurse of Jove, this goat who twice the world had traversed around, deserving both her master's care and love, ease and perpetual pasture, now has found. Cook's reception was not so happy. He returned home to find that his two youngest children had died and was given such a bollocking by the Royal Society for the inconsistent measurements of the transit that the terms of his censure were excised from the Society's official proceedings. The public regarded him as Banks's flunky and he remained very much a B-grader on the tea and cucumber sandwiches circuit. Banks now lobbied Sandwich, who had been reappointed First Lord of the Admiralty, to give him two ships to mount a final search for Terra Australis Incognita, and insisted that Cook command them. Within a month of the Endeavour's return, Cook found himself again ordered to search for a continent he believed he had already proved did not exist. The resolution, Cook's flagship, was bigger than the Endeavour, but not big enough for Banks who demanded that he and his now significantly extended entourage be given the captain's cabin and that the whole deck be raised a foot to give him extra headroom. The completion of these modifications was hampered by the onboard parties bank through for his groupies. When they were finally complete, the changes so overbalanced the ship that Cook refused to put it at sea and Sandwich ordered that the ship be restored to her original state. John Elliott, a midshipman on the resolution, recounted Banks's response. When he saw the ship and the alterations that were made, he swore and stamped upon the wharf like a madman and instantly ordered his servants and all its things out of the ship. Banks withdrew from the expedition in a huff. His resignation was so sudden that one of his entourage, Mr Burnett, did not hear the news and travelled as planned to meet the resolution at Madeira. Cook wrote to the Admiralty, Every part of Mr Burnett's behaviour and every action tended to prove that he was a woman. Banks had apparently been taking mistress smuggling tips from the French. When Cook returned and was fated for, again, disproving the existence of Terra Australis, Banks sulked. However, the pair were reconciled after Cook's gave Banks a new Tahitian, oh my. Cook attributed the loss of only one sailor to illness during the three-year voyage to his making his men get out of their wet clothes, stay out of draughts, clean their hammocks, eat their greens, drink plenty of fluids and wash up after every meal. While this makes perfect sense to every parent of a teenage boy, these were revolutionary concepts for the Royal Navy. The Royal Society was so impressed with Cook's ideas for not killing his crew that it awarded him the 1776 Copley Medal for being the year's biggest pointy head. In 1776, Cook set out for his fateful third voyage. Officially, his mission was to return Omai to Tahiti. This seemed an awful lot of effort for one Tahitian. The voyager's true purpose was to discover the fabled Northwest Passage thought to connect the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. 
During the voyage, Cook displayed unprecedented cruelty, refusing rations to sailors who could not bring themselves to eat walrus and ordering the ship's barber to cut off the ears of a native suspected of theft. He fell into cold rages, behaved autocratically and suffered periods of listlessness. Some scientists now attribute these personality changes to a dietary deficiency caused by intestinal worms. Others say he was just in a shitty mood. It all went horribly wrong in Hawaii. Cook was wrapped in red cloth, stuck atop a rickety scaffold and given a pig by a bunch of Hawaiians who thought he was their god Lono. Cook did not get to enjoy his divinity for long, as his worshippers soon stabbed him, cut him into small pieces, roasted him, before thoughtfully offering a fillet of Cook to his horrified crew. The manner of Cook's death, rather than his achievements in life, finally made him a pin-up in Britain. Banks had not been idle during Cook's absence. He had spent several productive years doing what he did best, schmoozing. In 1778, he was elected secretary of the Dilettante Society, which sponsored the study of Greek and Roman art, but was condemned by its critics as a club for the nominal qualification is having been in Italy and the real one being drunk. It was electricity, however, that gave Banks his biggest break. Benjamin Franklin had made his name by tying a metal key to a kite and flying it in a storm, thereby proving that lightning was electricity. This led to the invention of the lightning rod, which stopped tall buildings and ships from regularly exploding and earned Franklin an invitation to join the Royal Society, even though he was American. When Franklin helped to draft the US Declaration of Independence, his Americanness became a problem. His spiked lightning conductors were declared unpatriotic by King George III, who pressured the president of the Royal Society, Sir John Pringle, to endorse an ineffective British alternative that used a knob instead of a spike. Pringle refused, explaining, Sire, I cannot reverse the laws and operation of nature and the Royal Society was soon looking for a new president. Although he was only 35 and had not written a single scientific paper, Banks was elected as the Society's president. Because of his royal connections and his belief that pragmatism trumped the laws and operation of nature every time. It was now time for Banks to attain full respectability. He married a woman with a pedigree and a large bank balance and devoted his time to socialising and politicking over long lunches, rapidly expanding both his influence and his trouser size. He was now one of the most powerful men in the British Empire. And he had plans for New South Wales. <laughs>